Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Neighborhood Services District 5 and 6 Community Meeting. My name is Jason Perez, your Neighborhood Services Coordinator for Districts 5 and 6. If you have any questions about anything neighborhood related, please feel free to contact me at any time at 714-765-4398 or by email at jperez3 at anaheim.net. Before we get started, if anyone needs Spanish interpretation, please click on the globe icon located on the bottom right of your Zoom screen and choose Spanish. If you are on your smartphone, simply click on the three dots on the bottom right side and choose interpretation. Si necesitas servicios de interpretación al español, favor de oprimir el botón con la imagen del globo localizado en el lado inferior derecho de su pantalla y elija español. Si está usando su teléfono inteligente, favor de hacer clic en los tres puntos en el lado inferior derecho de su pantalla. Neighborhood Services District Community Meetings are part of the Anaheim Neighborhood, Service, neighborhood Improvement Program that assists residents to improve the livability of their neighborhood by enabling them to help themselves through the creation of partnerships with the city and other stakeholders. I encourage you to learn more about Neighborhood Services and our programs by visiting our website at anaheim.net forward slash neighborhoods. There you will find links to useful neighborhood information and the Anaheim Anytime app. We encourage you to utilize the Anaheim Anytime app on your mobile device or online to report issues in your neighborhood such as street light outages, graffiti, and potholes, just to name a few. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and we will do our best to answer your questions during the presentations. If we're not able to answer your question tonight, we will post the responses on our website at anaheim.net forward slash neighborhoods. Before we get started with the agenda, I'd like to introduce your council member for District 5, Stephen Fessel, who will be providing us with brief remarks. Councilman Fessel, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jason. Good afternoon, everyone, all of our neighbors. Uh, on behalf of my council colleague, Mayor Pro Tem Trevor O'Neill, who represents District 6, and myself, who represents District 5, we welcome you to our regular uh, neighborhood services uh, community meeting. Uh, there's a lot of information that will be pro provided tonight that's both applicable to District 5 and District 6. So uh, please become fully engaged uh, there. As Jason's already explained, there's ways of uh, asking questions and we certainly want to answer all of them. Uh, at this point, uh, thank you very much for participating and I'll turn it over back to um, Jason Perez. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Council Member Fessel for joining us tonight. Our first presenters are Jeannie Lee and Logan Selleck from the Orange County Transportation Authority to discuss the, LA, the La Palma Bridge improvements. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jason. Good evening. My name is Jeannie Lee, Senior Project Manager from OCTA Highway Programs. And thank you for inviting us to provi provide you an update on State Route 91 Improvement Project from State Route 57 to State Route 55, precisely west of State College Boulevard to the east of Lakeview Avenue. Here with me, we have one of our best community relations specialists from OCTA, Logan Selleck, and he'll be uh, presenting outreach effort for this project. So since the planning phase of the project, our project partners have been engaged and most of, most of them have been actively involved with the project. And of course, city of Anaheim is one of the partnering cities. And we're here today to provide a project update to the district five and six communities of city of Anaheim. And the project is led by OCTA and Caltrans, and we're coordinating closely with our partnering cities. Next slide, please. The State Route 91 Improvement Project is also known as Project I in Measure M2 Plan, and we're committed to delivering this project. And the project is currently funded with local or 91 Express Lanes net, net access revenue. The project provides operational improvements that are highlighted in three key segments going from the east to west in the order of segment. From 55 to Lakeview Avenue, the project provides westbound operational improvements as highlighted in green to your right. 
Between 57 and 55 interchanges, the project provide eastbound improvements as highlighted in orange. Near the 57 interchange, the project provides westbound operational improvement as highlighted in purple. Next slide, please. At the east segment or segment one, the current challenge is that the traffic from westbound Lakeview on ramp is crossing multiple lanes to reach 55 connection, which results operational de deficiencies. The project improves operations in this weave by three major improvements. First, realigning the westbound on ramp to direct traffic to westbound 91. Secondly, adding a new on ramp from Lakeview Bridge connecting directly to southbound 55. Thirdly, separate the westbound 91 traffic from southbound 55 traffic. Next slide, please. The middle segment or segment two will provide improvement, improvement by adding GP lane or regular lane in eastbound direction, which is highlighted in orange. Then to the right, the top cross section shows the existing and the bottom cross section shows a build alternative with one additional standard 12 foot lane, which is highlighted in blue. Next slide, please. At the west segment or segment three, the project improves westbound operations by first improving the weave from westbound 91 to northbound and southbound 57. Secondly, adding an auxiliary lane from 57 to west of State College and joining the existing. To further explain, to the right, the top cross section shows the existing again, and the bottom cross section shows build alternative with one additional auxiliary lane highlighted as a blue lane. Next slide, please. The main point of today's update is to inform you of improvements coming to La Palma Avenue Bridge. Due to the work on the westbound 91 to 57 connector, the La Palma Avenue Bridge will need to be replaced completely. And this slide shows a plan view of the improvements for segment three. Next couple slides will go over construction and detour plan of La Palma Avenue Bridge. Next slide, please. Currently, the La Palma Avenue Bridge has a history of being struck by tall vehicles traveling on 91 freeway, which creates an unsafe environment for community and travelers. As part of this project, the new bridge will be taller and wider to reduce the potential for vehicles hitting the bridge. This increase in height will also meet the latest standard for bridge construction. With the project improvement, and for the reason I just mentioned, the La Palma Avenue Bridge will be built at one time instead of two-phase approach and fully closed during construction of the bridge. This also reduced the time required for construction from two years to about one year. With one stage approach to construction, the number of full freeway closures for demolition and reconstruction are reduced by half. More importantly, this improves safety for community, travelers, and construction workers by allowing removal of existing bridge in a safe and efficient manner. Next slide, please. This slide shows a detour concept for one stage or full closure construction of La Palma Avenue Bridge. We have a couple detour options and both options have a minimal impact on travel time. For those who travel east on La Palma Avenue from Sunkiss Street to Blue Gum Street can take Mira Loma to Blue Gum Street and this detour would add about a couple minutes. Alternatively, for those who travel east on La Palma Avenue from Sunkiss Street to Kramer Boulevard can take Frontera and this detour anticipates to add about three minutes. Additionally, we plan to minimize impacts to travels and community in several ways. First, transit buses will be detoured and stops will be adjusted in coordination with OCTA as needed. Secondly, school buses will be rerouted and stops will be maintained. Thirdly, emergency vehicles can use the same detour routes with minimal time impact. We're currently, we are working with the city of Anaheim on all detour of the projects to ensure our detours are efficient as possible with the local traffic pattern and needs. Next slide, please. 
As shown on this slide nine, the project was environmentally clear in June of 2020. The design of segment three began in November of 2020 and is currently on schedule to meet our key milestone to complete design in late 2024. Construction is anticipated to begin in mid 2025, which would take about three years and complete in late 2028. And next slide, Logan Selig is going to discuss some of our upcoming public outreach effort. Perfect, thank you, Jeannie. And thank you all for inviting us this evening. Uh, my name is Logan Selig, and I'm a member of OCTA's public outreach team for the SR91 Improvement Project. Our team is committed to delivering a proactive and comprehensive public outreach plan to keep you and the rest of the community informed of the project. To ensure we can provide you up-to-date motorist information and project updates, we will be sharing project information both online and via traditional methods, such as postcards, flyers, social media announcements, virtual community meetings, to just name a few different ways we'll be able to connect with you in the community. As Jeannie covered earlier, construction isn't anticipated to begin until 2025. However, leading up to the start of construction, we'll routinely update our project webpage at octa.net slash a better 91 and send out emails as we reach our project milestones. We encourage all of you to visit octa.net slash a better 91 and click stay connected to sign up for our project newsletters. During construction of the project, a weekly email will be sent out notifying you of all upcoming closures for the week and a look ahead to major activities, including work on the La Palma Avenue Bridge. In addition, we'll continue to hold virtual community meetings and in the future hybrid or in-person community meetings to provide a space where you can feel free to ask questions in real time. Uh, next slide. We are here to serve you and your neighbors by providing the most up-to-date and accurate information on the project. On this slide, you'll find the project website at octa.net slash better91, and as well as the direct contact information for me and my colleague, Fernando Chavarria, who is the project manager for outreach on this project. Uh, you can contact us via phone or email at any time or with any questions you may have regarding the project. You can also find us on Facebook and on Instagram at a better91. And again, I encourage all of you to visit octa.net slash a better 91 to sign up for our project newsletter and get the latest information direct to your inbox. In closing, we'd also like to invite you to participate in OCTA's SR91 comprehensive multi uh, excuse me, uh, multimodal corridor plan study. Uh, the goal of this study is to relieve congestion in the SR91 corridor area by encouraging multimodal projects that improve transit and rail service and active transportation like biking and walking. To learn more, you can visit octa.net slash 91 plan, or you can take a brief survey online at octa.net slash 91 survey. And with that, that concludes our presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. For purposes of being able to progress with the agenda and other presentations, questions will be posed in the Q&A chat. I would just recommend to our panelists representing OCTA to be vigilant of the chat and to see if you can answer those questions online. Sure, I think the question um, that I see in the question box is, will traffic light duration left turn signals be adjusted for the increased tra traffic during rush hours? Uh, that would be all part of traffic management plan that we would be looking at it closely. And um, uh, if that's necessary, determined necessary, then we will um, work with the community to do, and the city of Anaheim, of course, to do that. Thank you very much, Jeannie and Logan, for the project information. Next, we have Community Preservation Manager, Sandra Lozo, who will provide us with information on the Community Care Response Team, or CCRT for short, and other important code enforcement updates. Sandra, the floor is yours. Good evening, thank you. Um, I'm going to go over CCRT update first and then some of the recent code updates, and then I can answer any questions in the chat. Uh, for those of you that uh, remembered, we did pilot our community care response team in 2021. Uh, we did see some big successes with that. And so we did extend that for an additional two years. Uh, that is fully funded through federal and state dollars that are restricted specifically to address homeless and COVID uh, for our homeless population. So um, no tax dollars from the city general fund is going into that. Uh, during the second year, we are looking at improving CCRT even further. 
Uh, some of the goals that we set last year was one to divert calls for service that are non-emergency, non-criminal related away from police uh, initial response and have our skilled professionals and community care response team or CCRT do the responding. And we see some successes with that. So we are test piloting, which we started this month, a low level crime call of trespassing. That seems to be the bulk of the calls that PD are still responding to. So we're trying to divert those calls that are, are not as dangerous. Maybe it's just a vacant lot. Maybe the homeless neighbors don't know that they're on private property. So by having our CCRT respond, it could be a different conversation, but also still issuing a trespassing warning and not only diverting that call, but maybe preventing a second call of trespassing or even an arrest by police if they're still trespassing because it gives them an opportunity to move from that private property location. Um, it is still uh, seven days a week, 14 hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So they're gonna continue that for the next two years. We also have our point in time count that will be happening this month on February 22nd through the 24th. And that's gonna be key uh, for the city of Anaheim. It is a countywide point in time count. Uh, the last point in time count done by the county was in 2019. And that was prior to our shelters being opened. Uh, that point in time count was 694 unsheltered on the streets of Anaheim. And we're hoping that number will be coming down now that we have over 250 people in our shelters currently and have funneled a lot of people through our shelter system into housing, uh, which has been huge for us. And we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, we also, as part of our pilot um, program and now an extension for the next two years is our UCI, uh, University of California, Irvine is gonna be doing a study on CCRT and our police department to see the pros and cons of having CCRT out there and looking at best practices as well as maybe stuff that we can improve upon or strengths that we have with the program that we continue to enhance. Regarding homelessness, we continue to run our park operations. Uh, we have some that are gonna be scheduled in the upcoming months and will include several parks in this district, five and six. We also continue to uh, partner with Caltrans. Uh, some unique stuff that's happening with Caltrans is not only they've been helping with us regularly with cleanups of, along their sections of their properties, but they also now are bringing in engineers out to see how they can do some environmental changes on their property to avoid uh, continued trespassing on their property, which will help with some of the encampment and trespassing in that area along our freeways. We also continue to schedule uh, Union Pacific Railroad cleanups pretty regularly. Uh, we just had some done in January and having some scheduled this month and next month, uh, but continue to focus on those particular areas. Um, since we are doing really good in our public spaces, uh, we have seen uh, some encampments on these particular properties. So continuing to partner with Caltrans and Union Pacific is gonna be beneficial for us. Another enhancement we've had is with our code enforcement officers that do pick up property for and book it for safekeeping uh, to help out our police department as well as our community care response team. We now have expanded that to seven days a week, uh, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. So that's going to help if we're marking property maybe around our libraries or community centers. On Fridays, we'll be able to go by and pick up those properties on Saturday or Sunday and book it for safekeeping in case someone needs to find it. We have proper signage at all of our facilities and parks that people can then retrieve that property. Uh, moving over to code enforcement, some of the highlights uh, and updates for uh, this particular meeting. Uh, one is our street vending that seems to have a huge uptick right now uh, with the decriminalization of state law. Uh, we have a permitting system for street vending. Currently, we have about six permits issued. Uh, right now in District 5, there's one that is permitted. It's a flower vendor on Lincoln and Sunkist area. Um, the rest of them, anything related to food, we don't have any current permits. So we are doing enforcement along with our Orange County Health Department. We're running into issues, not only not having permits, but not knowing how the food's being prepared, how it's being transported, how it's being cooked, uh, some dangerous situations of hot grease being dumped into our storm drains and other health and safety issues. So our health county, Orange County Health Department's partnering with us 
Uh, we are having another operation tomorrow night. So particularly in District 5, uh, we've been kind of hitting that State College Lincoln area, as well as Orange Thorpe and Placentia area. Uh, and also checking out in District 5 over by the Lakeview area where the old hospital was and making sure we're checking those uh, locations regularly. Please continue to Anaheim anytime to report any street vending that you uh, have issues with. We are logging that through and able to print out reports and uh, compare those to the reports that the Orange County Health Department's getting and making sure we're hitting all of the areas that our community is concerned about. Related to uh, illegal marijuana dispensaries, I'm happy to report uh, currently we only have two still operating that we are in the process of closing. However, none are in D5 or D6. Uh, also happy to report related to slap houses or the illegal gambling facilities that we've had throughout the city. Uh, currently citywide, we have zero that we are aware of um, and have shut down all the ones that we uh, we're aware of. So that's um, also a huge success uh, from the last meeting. Another enhancement too is our parking enforcement detail. We are going to be soon going to seven days a week as well, including some night times. Right now we have every day covered except for Sunday, but we're in the process of hiring some additional staff to help cover that shift. So continue to report any parking concerns. And I always like to send a reminder out, parking enforcement doesn't create more parking. It just helps protect those areas that we need to keep clear for emergency vehicles, excuse me, emergency vehicles such as red curb, fire hydrants, uh, blocking of alleys, that sort of stuff. And then also we uh, assist with the permit parking enforcement. We also are going to be meeting with some of the business owners along State College uh, in the Lincoln and La Palma area uh, as we try to partner up and address a lot of the issues that have been going on up and down that corridor. Uh, so that'll be encouraging because the more the businesses um, become aware and partner with the city, uh, the more we can continue to address any issues along that corridor. So those are all the updates I have and I will be on to answer anything questions in the chat room. I will have to jump off around 730, but I know Neighborhood Services will help uh, forward any other questions that I might miss after 730, but thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for that information. Next, we have Sergeant Brian Pacwa and Officers Beck and Voss will provide information on the PERT team and their work in the community. Officers, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jason, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, happy to be here. My name is Sergeant Brian Pack. I'm a community policing sergeant for the police department here. Uh, we have a lot of big things going on at the police department, specifically in districts five and six. Um, we're not going to focus on that tonight. Uh, as you all know, uh, one of the biggest issues facing uh, our city and most cities is homelessness. And go in, with hand in hand with homelessness is mental health. Um, one of the best tools that we have at the department is uh, our PERT team, the psychiatric emergency response team. And they're here tonight, and they're going to tell you about who they are and what they do. Officers uh, Beck and Voss, take it away. We're on, right? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, like my sergeant said, I'm Officer Beck. This is Officer Voss. We are the police half of the PERT team, which stands again for Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. Uh, we're here just to kind of tell you what we do, give you an overview. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, my partner, Officer Voss, here is going to talk about the benefits of PERT and some of our stats. So basically what we are is we are a mental health co-embedded team. We ride with two full-time police officers that have been trained in mental health. And we ride with a clinician from Orange County Mental Health. Uh, they ride in our car. We respond to assist patrol officers out in the field with mental health crises in the community. Um, we also do follow-up. We write 5150 holds and uh, we get and receive referrals from patrol from detectives, from federal agencies. Uh, we've done the postal, postal people, the Secret Service, I think FBI. We've also worked with the terrorism, terrorism Task Force. So we get spread out pretty much all over the city. We respond to all areas of the city. Um, we basically also provide mental health training to our patrol guys and to every trainee. So every trainee that comes on in the city rides with us for uh, about a week to see how we deal with mental health calls and crises. And then we also uh, recently received a grant, which is why we're here tonight. So we are the 
first full-time team in Orange County, uh, and that started in 2013. Um, since then, we've added a second clinician, and we recently received a grant that allows us to fund uh, a second team with her uh, two days a week right now. Um, we're also looking into some other grants to help that get expanded. Um, but that's really why we're here. To, we're going live. We've trained some officers over the last couple of years that fill in for us while we're gone on vacation. And so we're using that group of officers that have been trained in PERT stuff to now ride with our second clinician on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I forgot to introduce our clinicians, so I'll take care of that. Um, our, our first clinician that works Monday through Thursday with me and Officer Voss is Mary Tafoya. And then our second clinician is Christina Numamoto. She works Tuesday through Friday, uh, noon to about 9, 930. So we have coverage pretty much all during the week. We're missing Saturday and Sunday, but hopefully as our program expands, we might get a third clinician to work weekends. But here's my partner, Officer Voss. Yeah, so some of the benefits of PERT, probably <clears throat> the most obvious, if you can see on the video, our attire here, uh, th these are our uniforms. So we go in as a plain clothes approach. And the benefit of that is it changes the entire context of that contact from the very start. So instead of having two uniformed officers and a marked patrol unit show up at your front door, you've got two guys uh, dressed like social workers driving a plain white Tahoe. And it really sets the tone for talking more about um, mental illness issues and less about criminality and uh, criminalizing it. So that's the very first benefit that we have. The, the second is, like we said, combining those resources. So in the old days, or it's times when we're not working, <laughs> our patrol officers will either get a mental health call or the um, centralized assessment team from Orange County Healthcare will get a call. So if the police department gets a call and we determine it's a mental health call, then they would need to call out the CAT team clinician who would then meet and then they'd handle the call together. If the CAT team gets called out, they would have to wait for officers. So we bring all of that into one we respond at one time. So you've got all the resources right there when you need them. Um, we found that when our clinicians write the hold, we get access to follow-up services um, in addition to diversion services. So for example, we have access to a therapist who will come to a client's house if they can't make it to the hospital. So things that we would never have had as patrol officers. Um, we follow up with every mental health call whether it's hours or written from patrol. And what we found is that um, in hospital follow-up, when we follow up with people and they're still in the hospital, it increases communication um, both ways and results in better outcomes. If someone's been discharged from the hospital, then we schedule them for a home visit. And what we found is that when following up with people at home, um, it increases their likelihood to engage in outpatient services if they need them. So we can make sure they've got, you know, they weren't just discharged from the hospital without resources, that they actually have some resources if they need them, and then that they have access to them. So huge benefits. Um, on the other side, so if someone is in need of mental health services, but they're not emergency mental health services, um, patrol officers have someone to turn to for follow-up at a later time. So we can go back and offer that, offer access to those resources, outpatient services, in-home crisis, outreach and engagement for our homeless population. So we can bring all of those things to the table. Um, as far as our stats go, we've had thousands of contacts over the last eight years. Um, and we have only had two uses of force in eight years. So that's statistically relevant for the number of contacts that we've had. Um, from 2019 to uh, current, we've had about 3,000 contacts, um, another 3,000 follow-ups with about 500 mental health holds. Um, no use of force in the, that time, and we've got amazing results. So uh, we've had people from all around the country ask about our program. Uh, we still remain the only full-time two-officer uh, clinician team in Orange County, and we're always excited to talk about it and share that information with the community. Um, I apologize, I'm working off a of phone here, so I can't see any Q&A if there's anything 
Um, we got one question. We got one question. Somebody asked where we take our, our clients to. Um, we take them to designated facilities. Um, the one designated facility that we have here in the city of Anaheim is Anaheim Global. Um, we're also surrounded by a couple that we use uh, because we don't need Anaheim Global to get overwhelmed with mental health uh, crisis. So we also use St. Joseph's, UCI, and recently we had uh, Be Well OC open up. Um, they are also a designated facility that most of our patrol officers and us have been using on a weekly basis. They're a great new add-on to our, our, our designated facilities. Um, is there any other questions that, because we can't see them? I do have a question here from anonymous attendee. What is your average response time? So that's a good question. Um, we are only one team and the way it normally works is mental health calls come in three. Um, so we can only be at one place at one time. So if we're available, we, we pick up our stuff and head right out to the call. It's probably due to the size of the city. If it's out in the Canyon district five and six, then it probably takes us 20 minutes, 25 minutes to get there from our office. But what really bogs down our response times as of late is we have an ambulance issue going on here in Orange County. Um, we only have access to four ambulance companies that contract with the county. And recently, when I first started this program in 2013, our ambulance companies were running 15 to 30 minute ETAs for us to be very productive. Um, in the last year, though, our ETAs have gone from an hour and a half to three hours. So where we used to handle four to six calls a day, now we're handling maybe two to three a day with each clinician. It's, it's kind of bogged down our, our program. Any other questions, sir? And no additional questions are presenting themselves at this time, but uh, what we'll do is if there's any questions that are pertinent to your part of the presentation, we'll bring them up, we'll bring them up at the end of the meeting during the Q&A portion. Thank, Thank you, you officers. Thank you, Sergeant Pacwa and Officers Beck and Voss for your updates. If you just joined us, please remember that you can ask a question during the meeting by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Our panelists are free to answer questions as they're presented. If you need Spanish interpretation, please click on the globe icon located on the bottom right side of your screen. Si necesita servicios de interpretación al español, favor de oprimir el botón con la imagen del globo localizado en el lado derecho de su pantalla. Next, City Clerk Teresa Bass will provide us with an update on the redistricting process. Teresa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me and welcome community members from District 5 and 6. Thank you for joining us this evening. I wanted to take this opportunity to share, um, give an update on the Anaheim City of Anaheim's redistricting process. Um, we are actually in the final phase um, of the process where we started back in July and August of 2021. But to give a little background on why we're going through the process currently. So you may recall back in 2016, the City of Anaheim adopted its first district boundary map. Um, at that time, we utilized the 2010 census data in developing our six district maps that we currently have today. Um, the utilization of the census data was to ensure that each of our council districts were evenly populated and equally, equally represented by each of our, our city council members. Um, our charter at that time when we adopted our 2016 map also provided a provision that following any decennial census that the city was to come together, review its current maps, and to ensure given any changes in population that we would visit our boundary maps and to assure each of our six districts were still in equal population or nearly in equal population. What brings us to where and what we're doing now, the redistricting process. Next slide, please. So if you may recall, we went through a redistricting um, census, federal census con was conducted by the federal government back in 2020, and it was concluded about October of 2020. Um, given the pandemic, we did have some delays and even delays in receiving that information. Um, but we did receive the information uh, in September of 2021, and that new census data did show some changes in our population throughout the city of Anaheim. Um, it actually, from all six districts, it saw, it saw an increase of population across the board, but we did see some districts increase more than others. 
Um, with the district um, census data, we did see in districts one, two, and six, actually, their population was nearly to 1% deviation from the ideal population. Um, across the city, from our largest to smallest, we're seeing a deviation about 14%. And with that, we saw the most increase in District 5. Um, District 5, we saw the deviation from the ideal population that we would like to see about a 10%. We're actually in District 3 and 6, we saw an underpopulation about 4%. So given this change in our, our population and given the census data that we received, it kicked off our redistricting process here in the city of Anaheim. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, um, we started the process back in August of 2021. And this is just, as you see on this slide, is just where the redistricting process started and where we are now. Um, after July and August, we had our first uh, public hearing. We conducted a series of community meetings. At those meetings, we had our demographer come and join us, provide information on the redistricting process, the criteria that we're looking as we are looking to adjust our boundary lies to ensure that um, our, each of our districts will be in equal population. And then we came back um, with some adjusted um, information from our community members back in October and November. And what we did to, at that time during our public hearings was provide our council members with the feedback that we heard back in September as well as proposed maps that we received from our community members um, as we were reaching out to them, encouraging them to look at our current district boundary lines, um, ensuring to keep those areas of communities of interest um, together and intact and providing those recommendations and proposals to the city council. So on November 2nd, a series of public submittals as well as we had some district maps and proposals for our demographer, given the feedback that we heard in September from our community meetings, and presented our city council with a series of draft maps to present and to review. With that, following that public hearing, we went back into the community in November, December for them have an opportunity to see each of these proposed draft maps, provide feedback, and give us some additional information that we can take back to our city council. And that's what we did back in January 25th. If we can please have the next slide, please. So we held a, our fourth public hearing on July, January 25th. And at that public hearing, we presented council with 15 draft maps, um, 12 public submittals, and including the three city um, demographer submittals that were provided based on the comments and feedback that we heard not only from our community meetings that we held in September and in November and December, but also any emails um, and information that we received from the community. At that meeting, our city council narrowed down the 15 draft maps to four focus maps, given communities of interest, areas, um, feedback that the council members, they themselves heard from the community, and looking at one or two of the um, populations or districts that they felt really represented the city as a whole. At that public hearing, the city council, based on their comments, and comments that we also received at our public hearing, request our demographer to come back with any revised maps from our focus maps that we had. And that's what he did as well. If we can please see the next slide. So what you see here on this slide are the four focus maps that our city council will narrow the pool of maps. Uh, maps 102 and map 114 were both public submittals and maps 104 and 106 were maps that were created from our demographer based on those comments and feedback that we heard from the community. If we can please have the next slide. Maps 116 and 117 were the two maps that were created by our demographer uh, from comments as a request of our city council members, as well as public comments that we received at our public hearing. So these were two additional maps that were revisions from the focus maps, um, focusing on some areas um, that the council um, felt were important um, one in District 5, keeping the platinum triangle together. And then we saw some differences of where we would see the line division between District 5 and District 6, um, as well as the importance of keeping some of our other areas, our colony district and so forth in District 3. And so if we can see the next slide, please. So that brings us to where we are now. Each of those um, four um, focus maps, as well as the two demographer revised maps are all posted on our city's website. 
It gives an opportunity for the public to see each of the details. Um, on our map, if you go to anaheimredistricting.org and you go to the tab that says draft maps, we have each of the six um, map focus maps as well as the two revised from our demographer available um, with a PDF of each of those along with the de um, demographic summary for each of those. And we also have a, a hyperlink on that tab that's called interactive review map tool. On that tool, you have an opportunity. It's an interactive map that I suggest and recommend for all community members to visit. It gives an opportunity to really zoom in and out of each of the maps, um, an opportunity to layer on the current maps, um, see the details by street level, and have an opportunity to really see what the difference is between each of the maps that are pro um, proposed in the focus maps that council members are considering. If we can please go to the next slide. So we are asking our community members, we have our next uh, meeting on public hearing before our city council members on March 1st at 6.30. We're encouraging each and every one of you to please attend, as well as to submit comments by February 18th at 5 p.m. regarding any comments or revisions on the focus maps the council are re re uh, reviewing and considering. Um, any additional comments on communities of interest that you feel are important for this council to take in consideration as we will be reviewing this on our March 1st public hearing, where we anticipate our city council members to select a final map for adoption that um, after that adoption that they would be, we will be utilizing at our next public um, general municipal election in November of 22 and be utilizing for the next 10 years. So um, again, I ask you to come and join us March 1st at 6.30 or public hearing to um, hear from our council members as they make their review and selection of the final map encourage our committee members um, to submit written comments to redistricting at anaheim.net um, by February 18th. And that is so we can utilize and ensure those comments are included in the packet as they are presented to the council on March 1st. And please visit um, their website at anaheimredistricting.org. So you have an opportunity to see each of those maps um, in full detail as we have the PDFs as well as the demog demographic summary as well as the interactive tool that I highlighted that will give you an opportunity to really zoom in and out and see the details to each of the maps being proposed. Um, that concludes my presentation, um, available to answer any questions. Um, we do have the chat and I will monitor as we go throughout the meeting um, or feel free to email us directly with any questions at redistricting.anaheim.net and we're here to help you, assist you and answer any questions that you may have regarding our redistricting process. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Teresa, for the information. Here to provide us with information on the hazard mitigation plan and emergency preparedness is Dr. Janine Wilmoth from Anaheim Fire and Rescue. Dr. Wilmoth, the floor is yours. Good evening. I am Dr. Wilmoth. I'm the emergency manager uh, for the city for, and for the fire department. And I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, mitigation. Uh, mitigation are the actions that we take before a disaster strikes so the impact isn't as bad or it's eliminated. Next slide. Hazard mitigation specifically describes actions that we take to help reduce or eliminate long-term risks caused by disasters. So doing things like retrofitting facilities to withstand earthquakes or reducing brush around homes to prevent the spread of a wildfire. So usually when a disaster occurs, communities take the steps to recover from the emergency. A hazard mitigation plan is a way for the city to better prepare for these disasters. So when they do happen, less damage occurs and recovery is easier. Next slide. We start with a summary of the natural and human caused hazards that pose a risk to our community, including descriptions of past disasters and the chances of these causing disasters in the future. And then we look at the threat level and potential impacts for each hazard facing Anaheim residents, including our most vulnerable, threats to important buildings and infrastructure like hospitals and utility lines. The plan also includes policy and project recommendations that would reduce the threat and impact from hazards in Anaheim. As the costs of disasters continue to rise, governments and residents must find a way to reduce hazard risks to our community. Um, aside from protecting public health and safety, this plan offers a way that we can save money. 
Studies estimate that for every dollar spent in mitigation, an average of four to $6 is saved in response and recovery costs. AB 2140 is California legislation that requires a city to have a hazard mitigation plan to apply for some of the grants through the Federal Emergency Management Agency that we can use to further improve our safety. Um, it also requires that we incorporate this plan and its findings into the city's general plan. Uh, so it, and that is the city's comprehensive, more long-term blueprint for growth and development. To give you an idea of the scope of the plan, the emergency operations plan is the city's playbook for when we need to respond to disasters. It includes specific procedures to stabilize an emergency and protect lives and property. In the middle there, we have our hazard mitigation plan, which looks at hazards in general and how we can mitigate those hazards in a five-year period. And then on the other side, we have the general plan safety element, which takes those same hazards and incorporates plans to reduce those into our long-term policy to help keep Anaheim safe. We have already started our planning process. We have a hazard mitigation task force with representatives from each department. And we've been updating the information about the hazards that are in our community. So now we can prioritize what our greatest threats are. Uh, we're also reviewing actions and projects to mitigate those hazards. Again, it's all to reduce or eliminate the impact of these hazards in our community. Plan maintenance will outline how our task force will continue to monitor changes in hazards, changes in the city, progress on the mitigation projects, once it's finished, we'll prepare a draft plan for review, which is then sent to the California Office of Emergency Services and FEMA for their approval. And once that's done, we bring it back to our city council to adopt as the hazard mitigation plan for the next five years. So we would like you to help us with this process as we're reviewing what hazards are the greatest threat to Anaheim. We are asking for our community's input on hazards in your neighborhood. Uh, what are you most concerned about and how prepared are you? You can check out the Be Ready Anaheim website. Be Ready Anaheim is our approach to disaster preparedness here in the city. It's our partnership with the community to, re to be ready for disasters. There's a link uh, at the bottom of the screen there, anaheim.net backslash be ready. Uh, you can also visit anaheim.net backslash hazard, either way, uh, we'll take you to the survey. We'll incorporate the results into our updated plan. And then once we have the draft plan prepared, we'll post it on the same website for our community to review and provide feedback. We expect that to be posted in mid-March. When the plan is approved and adopted by city council, that will also be available on our website. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to contact me. Aaron is our planning consultant that we are using and his uh, contact email is there also if you have any questions for him. Um, hazard mitigation is our way to prepare the city and our community for disasters. If you are interested in learning how you and your family can prepare, we will be hosting our second emergency preparedness symposium in March, and we have a quick video with information about that. Anaheim Fire and Rescue's Emergency Management and Preparedness Section is holding a workshop to help Anaheim residents prepare for emergencies at home. This time, the free symposium will include training sessions on first aid, earthquake preparedness, and emergency preparedness for seniors, children, pets, and people with disabilities. The Emergency Preparedness Symposium is scheduled for March 5th from 9 to 12 p.m. at NorthNet Training Center. Any Anaheim community member over the age of 16 is eligible to attend. Registration is required. You can sign up by clicking the link in our Instagram bio or the link in our Facebook post. For more information, call 714-765-4048. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for having, for, for the opportunity to share.
Thank you, Dr. Wilmoth, for that information. I'd like to invite Fire Inspector Adrian Abel to provide us with a short update on vegetation clearance efforts in District 6. Adrian, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Inspector Abel. I'm with the City of Anaheim Fire and Rescue. And uh, just adding on to that uh, mitigation efforts, uh, obviously the 22, 2022 fire season is uh, around the corner. And with that, we do have a new uh, GOAT contractor that we have hired on. Uh, we met today to go over the logistics of uh, deploying uh, the goats out in the uh, Anaheim Hills in our parks and open spaces. And I wanted to let the District 6 uh, community know that that will be happening shortly. Um, we are waiting at this point to kind of see uh, when we start getting some of this explosive growth um, from these recent rains. We might we're anticipating we might get maybe another one or two more hits of rain. Um, and so somewhere around uh, the end of March to the beginning of April, we will assess uh, the, the growth out there and begin to deploy the goats uh, as soon as possible. And so you'll be seeing out there the, the goats again. Uh, I know people are excited about that. Um, they do a great job. And I wanted to let everybody know that uh, they'll be out there. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for that information. Next, we have Joseph Alcock from the Public Works Department who will provide us with information on the circulation element, which is part of the Anaheim General Plan. Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Districts 5 and 6. Good evening. Uh, again, Joe Alcock, a Principal Transportation Planner here with the City. And I'm here tonight to announce the start of our General Plan uh, circulation element update and also to provide kind of an overview of uh, what we'll be doing with this update process, our proposed schedule, and to highlight some opportunities for public input. However, before I get into that, uh, just a little background on the circulation element. First off, what is the circulation element? At its core, it's a planning document. It defines plans, policies, and transportation networks, uh, which we use to shape uh, long-term growth and also manage circulation and movement within and around the city. Uh, so why are we updating the circulation element? Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, first of all, periodic updates are required by the folks from Sacramento. Um, second, the current circulation element uh, was adopted in 2004, so it's somewhat dated. Um, and clearly a lot's changed in Anaheim since that time, especially with respect to development, land use, population growth. Uh, so the state requiring us to make these updates is actually a good thing and that it gives us an opportunity to tweak and better reflect the changes that have occurred within the city since 2004. And some of the things we'll be evaluating are shown on this slide. So um, looking at the city's changing transportation needs, uh, considering evolving transportation technologies, and then incorporating e uh, other planning efforts. Next slide, please. Um, so, and on this slide, here's just an overview of some of the anticipated changes we believe uh, we'll be making in the circulation element. So, focusing on updating things like goals, plans, and policies, uh, evaluating programs and strategies to manage congestion and uh, environment, our environmental requirements, updating our transportation network to accommodate future growth. And at this time, I can't say exactly what type of changes uh, these element, what we'll be making to these elements as it's ultimately going to be up to uh, you, the folks of Anaheim, the city council and other interested stakeholders to provide your input on how you'd like to see um, the city's future transportation systems and networks operating. And this is really why we're here tonight. Um, we are starting outreach efforts and we're beginning to get your input on the types of issues and concerns uh, that we should be evaluating as we develop recommendations for our circulation element update. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, so what opportunities will there, will there be for you to provide input? Sorry, uh, previous slide. Thanks. Um, our outreach efforts are going to be focused on two components. Uh, the first is a survey, which is shown here on this slide here, and it's designed to gain your feedback with questions focused on identifying uh, transportation priorities, areas in need of improvement, as well as providing opportunities for the public to provide sort of open-ended responses to us as well. 
that survey is currently live and you can access it uh, by uh, clicking on the link uh, shown here on this slide. So it's the uh, Moving Anaheim Forward survey. Um, you can also access the survey from our project website. So AnaheimCirculationElement.net, which is shown at the bottom of the slide. Um, if you want to access the survey, you'll scroll down onto the website to the section where it says, we'd like to hear from you. And if you click on the red hyperlink that says click here, it will route you to the survey, which looks like the um, survey, which is shown here on the right hand side of the slide. And then you'll start filling that out and submit that to us to um, you know, provide your input. We really want to encourage you to uh, take the survey and also urge you to take some time and really think about uh, your responses so that city staff can fully understand um, what type of transportation issues and concerns uh, the public currently has here in the city. Next slide. Uh, we'll also be conducting a public open house uh, next week. Um, it, it will be at 6 p.m. It will be virtual. Um, at this workshop, we'll provide an overview of a uh, general plan circulation element, kind of like what I've done here tonight. Um, and then we will display our transportation networks and uh, conduct a Q&A session to understand the types of changes, again, that the public would like to see for us to consider. If you're interested in participating in this workshop, you can click on the, um, the link that we've shown here on this slide. So um, it's the tinyurl.com moving Anaheim forward one. Um, you can also register via our website. You can go down to upcoming events section. And if you click the find or click on the circulation element workshop one listing, um, you can click that and then that will register you and provide you with a link to participate in that workshop next Wednesday. Next slide, please. And then after uh, that workshop, what's next? Um, after we've completed the public outreach, we're gonna analyze what we've heard from the public and start developing update recommendations for the circulation element. Uh, once we have a complete set of recommendations, we would conduct a second uh, public open house, likely in the spring, um, where we will present our recommendations uh, to the public to A, confirm um, that what we've interpreted from the input we've received is correct, and to also verify if we're moving in the right direction in terms of the changes we're going to propose. Uh, we don't currently have a second uh, workshop scheduled yet, uh, but we anticipate again that it'll occur sometime in the spring, so please stay tuned, check our website for that. And after uh, completing that second workshop, we will begin our uh, approval process of circulation updates to the circulation element uh, with going to the city planning commission and then to city council um, late summer, early fall is the current uh, target. And once the council adopts those updates, uh, that would complete the circulation element update process. And we'll be using the new policies and components of the circulation element to both manage and uh, shape future transportation uh, in the city here. Uh, next slide, please. And this uh, concludes my overview of uh, the outreach process for circulation element update. On this slide, um, my phone number is provided as well as my email if you'd like to ask questions or provide your input. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. And we'd also encourage you to go to the website, again, shown at the bottom of the slide, anaheim.net backslash circulation element. Go, go on there, scroll through, um, click on some links. You can sign up for updates. There's a survey on there, as I mentioned, as well as the public outreach workshop information. Um, and that's really it. That's kind of an overview of what we're planning here. And um, thank you for your time this evening. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Joseph, for that information. Additionally, the city is in the process of creating a new environmental justice element of the general plan. Environmental justice means ensuring everyone has equal access to resources like healthy food, safe and sanitary homes, and public engagement. We encourage you to learn more and participate in the process by visiting www.anaheim.net forward slash environmental justice. We've arrived to the Q&A portion of our meeting, which is a great opportunity to answer unanswered questions or ask questions not yet posed to our panelists. 
In performing a cursory review of our Q&A chat, I do not see any open questions. Our panelists have done an excellent job at really providing some efficient responses to those posed throughout the presentations. However, any attendee that is curious about following up with our panelists can do so. All their contact information will, provi will be provided to the general public on our Neighborhood Services webpage. In closing, I'd like to remind you again to visit our Neighborhood Services website at anaheim.net forward slash neighborhoods to view the information presented tonight or call us at 714-765-4456 to learn more about our services and ways we can work together to improve your neighborhood. Thank you for joining us this evening and I bid you all goodbye.